you are uh, uh, healthy and during the lockdown days i think there is nothing better than you know switching on to such an event at uh, eight o'clock in the night and just before your dinner you can have a little bit of brainstorming hello and namaste to all of you uh, some of you may wonder or you know some of you who may ask uh, why i did not say hi uh, because that's what is expected of a it person and uh, this is something which probably will have some relevance in the talk today why i say this is uh, in another event where i was the participant I had mentioned hello and namaste to uh, the participants when I joined. And uh, one of the people, are, one of the participants asked me, why I, why I didn't say hi? So that's why I'm referring to it here. That actually set my thought uh, process on. And uh, after that, you know, whenever I spoke to people, whenever some people say hi to me, some people say hello to me, some people say good morning, good evening. So I used to check why people want, why, why people say what they are saying, whether it's morning, evening, or hi, or hello, etc. So generally, when I took a, you know, a verbal count of uh, these highs, the people who say hi, generally, about a third of them, they said, they are playing safe because that is a trend today. And if I say hi, probably, the other person at the other end may find it more comfortable. And they wanted to play it safe. About sixty percent said that it was fashionable, and I identified myself with the modern day lot. And about ten percent said it doesn't make a difference. You know, I, I, in fact, I didn't say that because I it didn't come to me, come to my mind. That's all. So this is the statistics, a, a rough statistics of uh, hi and hello. And why I am referring to it today is uh, it's again a, a, a part of a thinking that sets into you without you are really knowing it. You know, mostly out of subconscious uh, application of mind, it sets into you. And today, exactly, this is the simplest example I can give you of thinking process and how free it is, how uh, you know contained it is, is for us to judge. Having said that, uh, I go on to the, my presentation. You know, uh, breaking free, thinking free, we'll come to that, but break, breaking free is something uh, not very new to uh, Malayali as such. Some of the ideologies took shape, took root in Kerala using the slogan of breaking free. But thinking free, globally, we have two two uh, major uh, segments of uh, you know life. One is the socio political, socio cultural uh, segment. Another is our you know uh, work related. When you look at the social, when you look at the socio political side, generally free thinking, free, breaking free is allowed. In fact, that's what people want. That's what people. That's the sentiment that they use to come to the forefront. But thinking free is generally not welcome. Because if they allow people to think free, then what happens is, you know, they, they may get out of hand. So generally, the thinking process is channelized. It is cleverly manipulated so that broader agendas can be put in place. I'll give you one example on this. Uh, there's a book called Bilderberg Conspiracy. Uh, student, written by a student. If you read Bilderberg Conspiracy, take it for what it is. You know, it may be 100% correct, it may be 50% correct, but even if there is an element of small truth in it, or 25% truth in it, they say that the pop music was invented by XYZ, I am not naming because probably it's a controversy. XYZ, in late 50s, when the youth of the world started questioning, reasons for war and 
whatever happened afterwards the economic revivals well, there were there were you know peculiarity to economic revival and the youth started questioning it so a group of people who later on became came to be known as the bilderberg group because this, the group met in bilderberg hotel which was close in switzerland this group had decided that the the entire the attention of the youth needs to be diverse Rockefeller, I am told, was a part of the group. Mitchell himself was a part of the group. About 26 people, I am told, if my memory is correct. Now they decided that the youth had to be engaged, and that's why, with a very deadly concoction of drugs, music, and sex, the group was cultivated. And of course, Beatles also came into the scene, led by none other than our own Mahesh Yogi. They were an ecstatic, uh, you know, uh, a, a picture, and over a period of time, rock music took off. Now it may look very, very funny. Probably many people might have heard about this, might not have heard of it. This is how thinking is channelized. So the youth got channelized. Their thinking process got blunted and channelized towards a particular area, so that other things were not seen. Today, what we are going to talk about is free thinking. We are not looking at the political side of it. Certainly, we are not uh, looking at the socio-political side of it. We are looking at the work side of it, or how we involve in our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, life in seeing that we whatever we do for you know to make a living. Uh, sir, really sorry to the sir, sorry to intervene. Uh, sir, your audio, audio is breaking in between. I think your mic is a little is bit okay away now? from. Is it okay now? Yeah, it's better now. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Okay. Uh, do I need to repeat, or is it okay? Yeah, yeah. It's it's fine, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, so today we are concerned about our uh, work life, our environment, and what we can you need to do about uh, freely thinking or using uh, free thinking to create, you know, our uh, uh, future. Okay. They, when I even uh, you know even if it's about our work uh, environment, I will certainly be touching on certain aspects uh, which uh, may be of a sensitive nature. You know, thinking free is a is like a razor's edge. It's sharp. It can be used effectively, but it can also hurt you at times. So some of the points that I might make might uh, you know uh, look as though it it uh, it is targeted at you, some of the participants. No, it is not really. I have no intention of, you know, judging anybody. I am not presenting here yardstick to judge anybody. So please leave it at that. Take it sportingly. Uh, none of you are really, uh, you know, targeted. And we are not going to see judgment on anybody. These are basically arising out of my experience in life, whatever I have tried, with, you know, whatever I knew. There could be contradictions on this, there could be debates, uh, you know, we could have debates on this, but probably not today, at a later date. Having said this, you know, uh, I would also like to say that uh, in many cases, I may say do this, do this, do this, I may not be doing it uh, entirely myself. So, rather than knowing where I stand, you know, probably I may also be like you, some of you at least, who are not doing it. So, we are on the same boat, we are on the same side of the table. So, now, whatever I have to say, sit back, clear, and relax. Having said this, I will go to the slide number one. This is something from Gita Jali, a great uh, Nobel laureate, our own uh, Rabindranath Tagore's uh, Nobel laureate. It's a poem, which is a very famous poem. I'm most more important about, uh, more uh, concerned about uh, six lines in this, which I've highlighted in this. I hope you can all see this uh, slide. Uh, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way in the dreary desert sand of that habit, where mind is led forward by thee, into ever widening thought and action. These, whatever I have highlighted in red, are very important words. And this is about free thinking. 
Now, whatever position you take on free thinking, if you can go to the meaning of each of these words, I think I don't have to talk at all. But this is the crux of free thinking entirely. And I'm very sorry to say that, you know, this is written, this is kept in most of the schools, in, in written in big boards. But when I ask the teachers, you know, do you know the meaning of this? I'm sorry that many, many times I don't really get people to react positively. Forget about students. These are things I think which should be taught to students. The Gidantini itself is a gold mine and these poems are the most famous uh, stanza in the, in the poem. Uh, I think we should know this. I'm not going to explain what this poem is about because that's not my job. But uh, I'm sure if you, when you get this presentation copy from EMI, probably you can go and have a look. Otherwise, uh, Gitanjali is available in the internet. You can always, you know, download it. I will start, before going into the talk as such, I will start with a few examples of, you know, free thinking and, uh, you know, the results of free thinking. One of the classic examples that we have in front of us is uh, Cochin International Airport Limited. Now, Cochin International Airport Limited, the thought process started somewhere in 90s, if I'm not mistaken, early 90s or late 80s. Uh, the concept of starting a private airport. Obviously, private airport was nothing new uh, in the world, but certainly in India it was not. This was a thought which I'm sure people might have come across a lot of objection to this uh, private airport. I'm sure that 9.9 .9 people out of 10 must have said this is never working here. From a point of uh, you know, disadvantage, I'm sure piece by piece, objection by objection, was, were overcome. I'm not saying overruled, overcome by the solutions and the whole jigsaw puzzle was put in place to form what is known as Cochin International Airport Limited. So this is what is called free thinking. We'll come to the you know basic elements later on, but I'm giving examples first so that when I talk about you know the free thinking process, you will be able to relate quickly. Mahatma Gandhi is another person. In fact, you know, I the, if I start listing down Mahatma Gandhi's uh, you know approach in free thinking. I, this slide will not be sufficient. It will run into multiple slides. But two things which I can mention to you about free thinking is Satyagraha. Now, Satyagraha uh, was something created out of the blue. Till then, protest meant violent protest, or protest uh, uh, meant, uh, you know, uh, representations and writing, etc. But Satyagraha was a new tool altogether. Similarly, the Dandi March. Now, Dundee March was something which he created out of nothing. So that is what, that, that, when you have to do that, you will have to be completely uh, away from all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, prejudices, uh, you know, presumptions, etc., etc. Let's look at Bill Gates. Where did Bill Gates come? Everybody, every most of us know about Bill Gates. Now, Bill Gates also created something from nothing. He came into the scene when Apple was already dominating. And nobody would have thought there would be anything but Apple or anything but Apple like computer. But 15 years after he made his debut in 1977, if I'm not mistaken, Apple had to struggle. To create and to retain an identity. So it's a long story. I'm not going into the details now, but anybody during the chat session, anybody would like a specific answer to it, I'll probably have it. Our own, we have in Trivandrum city itself, there is a person called Emma Narayan. I keep referring to him every time. He's a classic example of creative thinking, free thinking. Those of you who do not know him, you know, he is the person who introduced for the first time a computer, a mini computer or micro computer. I won't call it a mini computer because I was selling mini computers like HP 2000, Wax uh, 780, 730, etc. It's called, it cannot be called a mini computer, but he introduced what is known as a micro computer, which later on was uh, 
you know, uh, it was something equivalent to HCl, HC, and the like. So those of you who were there in this field in 80, 85, 90, etc., you will know about HCl, HC computer. So it fell in that uh, particular category. But he is the first person who introduced for the first time in India a, a microcomputer uh, with using Zynog uh, processor. It's called a microprocessor. He is the first he is a person who introduced for the first time in India a computerized telex machine which sold all over India. He had complete service network all over India. He's the first he is the person who introduced for the first time in India a stabilizer which de defied all conventional uh, expectations, which is called a transtap. The transtap was later on, everybody knows, uh, or uh, you know, uh, the one and only Pucha who says, uh, Chukla Pali worked with the transtap in this uh, stabilizer unit. And later on, it was hived off and he started on his own. So the predecessor of Vigard perhaps is transtap. He is a person who introduced for the first time the uh, STD billing machines all over India. It's a unique product, it is nowhere seen anywhere else in the world, for perhaps it was done only for India. And it goes on the floatels in the floating hotels. The list is very, very large as far as he is concerned. So we have our own MR Narayan who can be considered as a person who uses free thinking to develop you know, new ideas implement new ideas, new uh, uh, technologies, etc. in the field. Uh, IBM PC is a great story in this category. Again, like Bill Gates, I'm sure Bill Gates have, uh, Bill Gates had uh, certainly helped IBM PC become a reality and a reality in such a force that it came into being. IBM PC strategy, I just briefly mentioned, the strategy was very clear. Again, there, that was where the free thinking has taken, uh, you know, taken its, uh, I mean, uh, had its impact. IBM, what they did was they bought out a processor called 8088. Uh, if, uh, uh, you know, people who are involved in uh, this field in 80s are listening to this, they will remember this. 8088, Intel 8088 chip was actually making a loss. And Intel finally decided to close down. And that was a time when IBM was actually looking for a processor and a board, deciding a board. They bought out the 8088 facility and helped Intel uh, come back from closure. And that 8088, it was completely underwritten by IBM. They designed a board. They uh, leased out the technology license out the technology and the board to four different companies to produce what is known as the IBM PC compatible. I don't want to name the one of them were comp one of them was Compaq, another was Trijam, they were multi-tech and there's a more company. So this on a fine day you had Apple on one desk and IBM on another desk and another five IBM PC compatibles on five other desks. So every store you went, you had one Apple and six IBM PC compatible. So that's how they overtook uh, Apple in no time. Apple's share, the market share was reduced from 90% to less than 30%. That's a something creative thinking. Today, if you look at it, I really, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say that you don't find innovative marketing, innovative product design, innovative uh, strategies, in the market very rarely you find it it's just a question of numbers and these are all short-term goals long-term goals very few companies have maybe this covid may produce a, a change in thinking and many people may look at long-term goals and of course my pet project drdcl i have to say a lot about it in fact one one hour won't be enough one day will not be enough but i'll briefly tell you uh, trdcl is a company, in fact, it achieved United Nations recognition. It is one of the seven projects in uh, transportation sector. Forget about urban transportation, in transportation sector, it is one of the seven projects which has been uh, taken as a reference projects by United Nations Center for Excellence on Public Private Partnerships. Many people may not know that. Many people may think that, you know, this is something talking through the hat. It is not. 
The project was taken on various counts. You probably you are aware that United Nations has uh, rolled out this project called Sustainable Development Goals (SDG 2030). By 2030, United Nations want all projects in the world executed under government supervision to have certain benchmarks, and these benchmarks will have to see that whatever the project outcome is, it must satisfy people's needs entirely no people, no person people groups or a region should be marginalized this is a very very lofty goal goal and in that project one small portion is public private partnerships and in that public private partnerships uh, there is something called stakeholder engagement but i'm very happy to say that the stakeholder engagement definition was uh, influenced by me when they called me to Geneva for a presentation on this project, presentation, they don't accept PowerPoint presentations. You have to talk to them, you have to explain the whole project. And in that discussion with around 300 working groups across the world, uh, they agreed to change, uh, you know, the uh, stakeholder participation uh, uh, slightly so that my view is considered there. And because of such interventions there, they have taken me now into the experts group on deciding benchmarks for stakeholder engagement in a public-private partnership. I'm just mentioning that. But more than that, TRDCL, what it gave to you as a person who enjoys the Trivandrum roads is phenomenal. So there are various facilities uh, which I can go to. I will probably, when I give you the example, I just show you a few examples. You know, this is one uh, uh, island in uh, Sastamangalam where we had encountered tremendous amount of objection in cutting of trees where we certainly did cut the trees and retained one tree to give the junction a beautiful look these circles you know there was a tremendous amount of objection to these circles but we still made made possible by discussing with people and giving them various various reasons why it should be there and we made it possible uh, this is one uh, you know, in, in BJT Hall, now it's known as Ayankali Hall. In front of that, we had Patamdamula statue. The statue, if I am, uh, it's very unfortunate that I don't have the old photograph with me. But this was another creation. Now, this is an old photograph. I don't have the new photographs. We had in such islands, there are so many islands, there are about 88 islands in Trivandrum City like this, which we had constructed, which is actually outside the scope, not inside the scope. We had only to construct uh, the uh, island like this, but the turfing part was not there. We were supposed to cover it with concrete and leave it at that. Maybe do some, you know, little bit of, uh, you know, uh, road furniture, we call it some seats, concrete uh, benches, etc. But we decided to give it a turf, that is a green turf. And then on this, we planted, on similar islands also, especially in this island, I had planted gooseberry, elegant. And uh, there are uh, pomegranates, madanam. There are uh, uh, jamba, jamba, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, I think it's called the Javanika, I think. Uh, jamba, then we also had uh, uh, Eric, I don't know what is the name, it's a botanical name in uh, English. Uh, Eric actually is one small bush which helps uh, butterflies to lay its eggs, and we get exotic butterflies from that uh, bush. We have planted that. And almost all traffic islands in Trivandrum. I've got a variety of uh, such food bearing trees. The purpose was that we get birds back into the city. And then, of course, the greenery. Many, I had a lot of many objections. People said that, you know, you give this to the people of Trivandrum, they will trample over it and destroy it. I said, let them do it. We will go on maintaining it. Ten times they do it, eleventh time, they will say that they will not want to destroy something which is so being meticulously maintained. Now, this worked, and today all the islands in Trivandrum are kept beautiful. Now, another thing I wanted to mention this in terms in the context of uh, free thinking is that the moment I decided on that, I had a lot of people from government uh, trying to tell me that we should take. Now we have decided on this outside the scope. We are going to spend more more money. Let us get some landscaping consultants to do the job. It's a brilliant idea, but they came up with you know, a red palm, yellow palm, sorry, green uh, yellow palm, red palm, all kinds of exotic flowering plants, etc. 
I said, no, let's go for something local, something which will bring back the birds. Okay, this is another way of thinking. I just mentioned that. These are, you know, this one is a fire, fire hydrant that you see here. To retain this, probably I might have spent extra. But we had around uh, uh, 16 such fire hydrants in Trivandrum city still in working condition. More than the, the uh, utility aspect of it, I was looking at it from a heritage point of view. It really looks nice to see the, the uh, fire hydrants in Trivandrum city uh, in different places. We have a couple of them in Statue Junction, we have in Museum Junction. This is uh, War Memorial. <coughs> Goes on and on. Footpaths became a standard all over India. Generally, in India footpaths, you know, were 20 centimeters high, but we decided that we will make it 15, 12 centimeters. Why is 12 centimeters? Because we have the aged population in India. Generally, most of them, not not only in India, abroad also, they have knee problems. Now, imagine a person if they have to climb from the road to the footpath, it will be a problem. Second thing is today's cars are very low, you know, their uh, clearance is very low. Now somebody parks a car on the roadside and opens the door, it hits the uh, footpath. You must have, uh, you know, faced this problem in other parts of this uh, state. And the third and most important is that this footpath from one, even if there is a road which is two kilometers in length, so a logical end and beginning and end, then from one end to the other you can walk without looking down. It's a continuous footpath. There are no cuttings for property entrances. This is the first time in India such low footpaths without any property cutting was uh, made. And uh, in fact, for this also, we had come, uh, I had faced a lot of luck, but then ultimately I had my way. This is again a, you know, a free thinking, something taking shape out of, uh, you know, free thinking. Uh, and, and in free thinking, what you do is you try to find out sufficient grounds support your action so that you are not you are able to establish that you are not biased in one way or the other at that pace so this is about prdc i can go on talking and talking and talking so these are some examples of uh, projects and people now let's look at perceptions They're very interesting i'll just tell you a few there are thousands and thousands of perceptions we can go on talking Drinking water, six to eight liters of water a day. That's what we have been told that we need to take eight, uh, eight, six to eight liters of water a day. I don't think there is any any bigger myth than this. If you search the internet, you will come across at least there are fifty articles. Forty-eight of them say that this is not necessary. In fact, some even say this goes in, goes to water uh, poisoning. Okay, I don't want to go further into it. Milk powder versus breastfeeding. Most of us know, who are at least uh, above 40 years of age, you know that there was a time, at least especially between 60s and uh, you know mid 80s, uh, the West, especially the West, used to say that milk powder is the best solution for a baby, and breastfeeding is something harmful to the mother. Do we agree to that now? No. There's something called sits. Sudden infant death syndrome. Now, this is uh, when I came across this, is when I started looking back at stories that are fed to you, you know, stories that guide you away from truth. And then it's so convincing that you start believing certain things. That means you are, you are becoming enslaved. Now, what is SITS? SITS is sudden infant death syndrome. I, I don't want you to spend time going through this text, but I just put it here so that somebody who wants to look at it can look at it. A, a person called Vanetta Hoyt, uh, yeah, in 90, from, I think, 1972 uh, onwards, five of her baby, babies were killed in what is known as sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, and, uh, you know, he went on, when the doctors, uh, when the first baby died, the doctor checked, checked up the baby and said, okay, fine. Second baby died, in a matter of, I think, a year or two, second baby died. Then the doctor found that there is something wrong in it. But doctor also found that if I could put this under sudden infant death syndrome, infant death syndrome, which was becoming a, a subject of discussion then, he decided that it's money for it. 
and the next at that point in time if he had uh, stopped this woman from moving further then probably three more deaths could have been avoided what happened is after five deaths and uh, you know after five deaths this doctor uh, who was uh, attending to her had uh, put up a paper uh, on sits and uh, he was uh, suddenly he became overnight he became a hero not only that reader says articles in 95-96 on this subject goes on to say that he had helped an industry of uh, infant monitoring machines a multi-million dollar industry to mushroom and he was part of the industry so this is what what i say uh, you know as feeding uh, 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 wrong information and taking away from truth this we have seen now today we keep hearing about temperature and sunburns every year around uh, february march we say that scorching heat uh, you know sunburns uh, regular media uh, use for your information if you check with the the uh, weather uh, bureau department you will get information because we have from 2004 onwards i have data and i have been listening closely with the uh, department of uh, weather department if you look at it you will get the data which says that temperature increase has been marginal maybe 0.5 to one degree in the last 75 years which means 75 years back according to data available that performed now this increase in temperature is marginal what 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 does it mean that again the window temperature according temperatures have been recorded earlier also close to what is recorded now but the window has increased okay that is where now we need to look at it the window which was around five minutes ten minutes now it is becoming around 30, 15 minutes 30 minutes why does the window increase is because of heat dissemination by heat what by bodies which has absorbed heat okay. what does which bodies absorb heat and disseminate it slowly are structures structures means buildings high rise buildings so what are we fighting when you come when you talk about temperature when we say that because it's being, because trees are cut so these are you know we are being guided a certain level by certain vested interests and we are not allowed to think freely and sunburns but believe you believe me sunburns have been there all along i myself was a victim of this in 1974-73 when i was working in the field with uh, the workers in the field and my uh, you know head the worker there or you know eventually told me that boss that punya this is not meant for you because your body will get burned i had the sunburn on my shoulder for about a week it was very painful and what he said made sense he said that you don't get it because we apply ginger oil nallana no? we apply ginger oil after every day's work we apply ginger oil oil and water today why the sunburn becomes very important you fall to that trap because today body lotions the body uh, you know sun sunscreens are uh, have to be sold okay, that may be one of the reasons environment and trees it's a very funny situation if you really go to the uh, ministry of environment uh, and uh, ministry of environment they have a site called envis site which is a official authorized site envis site tell you that the green, uh, green cover in india has increased from 18% in 1975 to 28% and in kerala it has uh, increased from 28 to 29% or to 34% when i spoke about this to some of the environmental they are saying it is rubber no rubber they have classified rubber and such cash crops they have classified into that comes around four percent so these are all information which is fed to you without any positive intention but with negative intention and we should know that and a very very interesting uh, you know aspect about dress and turnout now we why do we dress you say we dress because we need to look smart especially in office when you are talking about a work environment you uh, you dress because you should look smart you dress because your dress actually is something which you you are uh, communicating it's a medium of communication you are communicating your 
you hold it, that you respect him or her. When you are in official duty, if you are going, if you are wearing a dress which suits you, not dress, that means your beholder, your client. In the marketing terms, it's your client. If it's in your office, it's your boss. So don't tell me that if you go in a very casual dress, in bermudas and t-shirts, you are respecting your boss. No. You are basically establishing you or identity there. But what you need to do, if you really have to work as a team, you really have to work as a as as a one entity, then the person on the lead has to move. This is not what I'm going to say is not uh, connected with uh, the topic of today, is that a good follower is a good leader. A good follower is a good leader. So when you are a good follower, the team moves forward. When everybody becomes a leader, nobody moves forward. So your boss, you have to respect him. And the best way to give him respect, one of the best ways to give him respect, one of the best ways to give a respect to your client is to dress well, not gaudily, not uh, fashionable. Because fashionable dress always, fashionable and gaudy dress always distracts your beholder. Uh, and uh, attention for what purpose you went there may not be a full thing. One example of this, one example of this dress and turnout is uh, the example of Gandhiji himself. Gandhiji went to the round table conference in uh, England uh, with Victoria, Queen Victoria. He refused to wear suit. He went in his uh, normal, you know, as a half naked fakir. And we all know the story. He refused to wear a suit and he was denied entry. And he said that we are not com coming for the, the round table conference unless I am allowed to come in this. Now, in that act, what was established, what was achieved was a snub to the queen, which India wanted very much. So, what I have told here is uh, justified or I mean, established by uh, Gandhiji's action. And then we have Trivandrum versus Kosi. These are all actually information which affect you, which you are you, basically, I'm, I'm just establishing that you are not allowed to think freely. You are guided along a channel and then you start taking decisions, you start actions which may not be in the right path. The last one here is Trivandrum and Kochi. Now, uh, I don't want to create a debate, I mean, a, a, a conflict here or a debate, but I'm just giving you the fact. If uh, I ask anybody which is the largest city in, in, in Kerala, people will say it is Kochi. Which is the um, uh, most thickly populated city in uh, Kerala, they say Kochi. These are all not correct. If you go by 2001 census, 2011 census, it is all there in the uh, internet, virtual space. The Vandrum city is the most thickly populated city. The Vandrum district is the most thickly populated district in Kerala. Second district, as a thickly populated district is Alakri. Ernakulam comes only fourth. Trivandrum and Kochi, if you consider Trivandrum and Kochi, the, for the same area, in fact, the city as such, Trivandrum is 7.6 lakhs and Kochi is 6.9 lakhs. 7.9 lakhs and Kochi is 6.6 .6 lakhs. So there is about a lakh and 20 difference in that itself. But when you take, and we are comparing, 210 square kilometers of Trivandrum city versus 400 square kilometers of Kochi. That's another anomaly. Now, when you talk about metro, Kochi is 717 square kilometers and Trivandrum metro, which the government has considered is 410 square kilometers. And in 410 square kilometers, it is 16.8 lakhs population and Kochi metro with 700 square kilometers, it is 21 lakhs. That they have done so that it goes above 20 lakhs. But for the same area, Trivandrum population is 30% higher. It is 30 lakhs. Now, this is there in the internet. I am only mentioning this so that how we, how we are being deceived by data which is given to us. So, whenever a data is given to you, you start you should start analyzing. And last but not least important is public service, service versus private service. Whenever, you know, it's, it's fashionable to say public service is bad and private service. I don't agree to this. I have been, uh, let's take the case of, uh, you know, I'm, certainly there will be many people here who are working in private hospitals. There's nothing wrong in private hospitals, but 
But I certainly say this because private government hospitals are given a vaccine. I certainly say that government hospitals, the kind of service that you get there are far better than private hospitals. Forget about the money. I have got personal experience and I continue to, to uh, patronize government hospitals. Point number two, we talk, talk about uh, uh, Air India. You said that Air India is a hopeless service. I disagree on that. On the ground, yes, maybe Air India is not, it doesn't behave you if you ask for, as, for, you know, as uh, uh, solve uh, as you know, private uh, airline. But the net result of all this behavior, etc., is in flight. And in flight, I can tell you that Air India is one of the best airlines in the world. I have no complaints with that. I have a lot of experience. If you take a baby on board, the kind of attention that you get from the, the uh, staff inside the aircraft, you cannot compare with what you get in the private aircraft. There are various reasons for it, but there's nothing wrong in private airlines. But the only thing is, do not slight, do not you know, put down the government service. The uh, Kerala government, KSRTC, any government uh, state transport uh, corporation, I don't know about other corporations, but certainly I know Bombay, uh, D, uh, uh, sorry, Bombay uh, buses, but Kerala, Certainly, the drivers are much better than the private bus drivers. Much, much better than the private bus drivers. Conductors are much, much polished than the private bus conductors. There is no doubt about it. And another fact that we should know, which we have been told, which we have been allowed not to look at, is that in the world, there are very, very few places where public transport is in private hands. So these are all some indicators of you know, our perceptions where we have been disallowed from thinking separately. Now, one more is that Kerala is a very healthy state, is something which we have been told. I'll just give you the uh, national sample survey. That is the 71st round of national sample survey mor on morbidity. It's actually 2015 data I have, but 2018 I could not get. 2015 data says out of 18 per Persons out of thousand, per, eighty-nine persons out of thousand persons uh, surveyed reported ill during a fifteen-day period in India. That is the Indian national average. Whereas in in Kerala, it was three hundred and ten out of thousand, which is more than three times. Among sixty-plus category, that is sixty years and above, this was two hundred and seventy-six for India, whereas it was six hundred and forty-six for Kerala. Kerala has the largest incidence of non-communicable diseases in India. Which is also considered as the diabetic capital of India. Okay, and uh, these are not going well for us. Why I am saying this? We should understand anything, any data given to you, any piece of information given to you. If we need to act on it, then we should look more into the details and try to find out the real, uh, uh, the truth about it. And truth is about. Now, when you th start thinking free, I'm sure I must have hurt a lot of people uh, who are attending this with various data, but truth is always uh, painful, okay? And thinking free is a thought process which is not influenced by anybody. All the data which I have given, I have nothing against any of uh, the, any, any, any people, any uh, group or any uh, particular area, group of people who gave me that information. But what I have saying is I have taken the pains to go into details and find out. So thinking free is a thought process which is not influenced by anybody, any concept or anything concerned with it. And uh, uh, it is not influenced also by faith, ideology, caste or creed or language or religion. And it should not be influenced by fear. Why I mentioned about fear is that in, in my job as a TRDCL head, there were many times when the action I was able, about to take, I was warned that I will face problems, sometimes even physical problems. But then I said that if that is what I am destined to, I will certainly do it. So that is something. But of course, I found out ways and means of uh, overcoming such threat, and not by any other, uh, you know, uh, unlawful means, but by you know, call, uh, and, uh, you know uh, talking to people who could create problems for me, trying to convince them, a communication channel was established and, you know, I could allay the fears. Ultimately, I could 
to show them that I meant what I said. Okay. So fear is one factor which could influence a thought process, not influenced by environmental ecosystem into modern terminology, ecosystem considerations. So that is, uh, uh, you know, wherever you have grown up, grown up, you may have certain, uh, you know, commitments, you may have certain obligations, not be uh, influenced by such uh, environmental considerations. And of course, it should be free of pretensions. This is something which I have highlighted that because I put it in bold because this is something which we come across every day in uh, large numbers. Most of the things, you know, that we do ultimately is basically on the surface only. It is only to promote yourselves, uh, promote uh, your, uh, you know, very narrow interests. And our thought process should not be used for that. Uh, most of these people who do this are successful because they, they are able to step on this and go forward leaving what they have stepped on behind. And this, but ultimately, for the society, this is not good. One example of thinking free, if I say, would be children. Till they are six years. In fact, we have, we used to say in our house, uh, jokingly, uh, every day you inject poison into the child, and by the time he is six, he is uh, seven, eight years old, he is completely poisoned. Look at a child, look at his eyes. When you meet a child for the first time, if he's not a shy child, the way he looks at you, the way he listens to you, uh, it will sometimes make you squim because it's so intense that every second, every sound and every visual uh, experience is blinking at him. And this is how free thinking, this is the fundamental requirement for free thinking. Every time you see something, hear something, something comes before you, you must look at it as it's something new. And children are the best examples for you. What is free thinking? I have already told you, I think, the ability to think without the help of or within the ambit created by attitudes, character, or picture postcards in which one spends his or her life. Attitudes, these well, some of the people who are participating in this may be above 60, some may be between 60 and 30. The moment you are above 20, it's very difficult for you to change. Not very difficult, difficult for you to change. As, it, as you age, it becomes very difficult for you to change. Your attitudes are set. The free thinking, if it has to uh, happen, it has to happen through an attitude and change. If your attitudes are already good, don't change. But if the attitudes have to be changed, you may have to relook at it. Your character is also very important. The character and attitudes are different. Attitudes are something which, you know, you probably uh, react to situations and re react to the society. Your character is how you start contributing to the society. You know, self-contribution. And the picture postcards are what create your character and end up in attitude. Now, what are picture postcards? Picture postcards are those frames you are frames you are in your conscious or subconscious mind which affect your understanding and reaction. These are frames which happened during your instances in your childhood that make up your character. These in, those instances from your past that you cherish or detest. Let me give you an example uh, of uh, a picture postcard. Uh, you know, uh, you smell as a boy or a girl of uh, four years, five years, you smell a flower and suddenly the, the bee inside bites your nose when you stop smelling flowers. Generally, it happens. So, this is one instance which makes up your, uh, there's a frame in which this frame is goes into your mind and whenever next time you see a flower, this frame comes back. This way, in fact, this is this itself is a topic I can go on talking about this for a long time. So, your thinking process is affected by the frames that has affected you in your childhood or in your in your uh, you know period from childhood to adulthood. Whatever has happened to you, that is why the trauma that women go through in their their you know uh, adulthood, I mean uh, childhood to adulthood. Is very important because women are more sensitive. 
So these are the frames in which you live. Your parents are fighting. The first fight, you may probably look at them in awe. You may look at them and look at them surprised. And the next time, you look for indications of, uh, you know, a father talking a slightly with a high, you know, high pitch father talking in a slightly high pitch, and you know that there's going to be a problem. So then you recall the frame, and then you're prepared for that fight again. There is a beggar coming to your house asking for something for a child. The beggar comes, uh, he is paid uh, one rupee or two rupees or five rupees. The beggar goes away. Then you suddenly find that the beggar, you know, a limping, if it's a limping beggar, after the corner, then you start talking well. Then for your life, you don't trust the beggars. Now, when you're 50 years old, when you, if you ask, if uh, somebody asks you why you don't trust beggars, even if you are not able to recall, this is something which affects your reaction in your, in your childhood, you have been cheated. So these are frames in which you live. Most of you, now we look back, most of your reactions in life are these frames. I mean, you, you yourself can do this analysis. Now, I can give you one small example is, you know, if I were to show you three different pictures of a UFO, three different pictures, uh, let's say one pipe and one square box and one maybe a vertical cover. And uh, I would ask you, are they, what are these? You will probably say it's a vertical tower, a box, and a pipe. But if it's a UFO, if I say it's a UFO, you may not agree. Because you, in your understanding, in your childhood, in your lifetime till now, UFO means what pictures you have been shown are flying saucers. So, this is the frame in which you live. So, if this is the case, you cannot be said to be thinking freely. And why? If, Free thinking. Why do we need to think freely? If you know the life, the way we are living is good enough, then why do we need to have free thinking? It's essential to liberate one uh, to have a detailed and unbiased view at the same time from all angles. Now, why do we need it? It's your choice. You know, nobody forces you. If you are comfortable and complacent the way it is, all right. But it, uh, if you need to contribute to the society by way of you know, some kind of uh, services, some kind of products, uh, some kind of support to the society, then probably this is probably the starting point. Okay. And it also is essential to encourage people to experience each moment. Like I showed the picture of the boy, they experience each moment, each object, each process. This will stimulate change. It generates creativity in all areas of intervention. Something that is different from regular run of the mill reproductions, whether it be thought, speech, or action. I can give you hundreds of examples, and typically what you can see in front of you is, as I said, CR is one example, uh, Random City Road Project is another example, where every aspect, you know, like for example, the signal posts, the Indian Road Congress says signal posts may preferably be painted in yellow, but I have painted it in green, dark green, very dark green. There was a big controversy on this. In fact, I was pulled up by the PWD department. I was pulled up by Dr. N. S. Srinivasan, who is my guru, uh, former director of NATPAC, who was the convener of this project. But I stood my uh, stand because uh, I knew with my intervention, my, with my uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, involvement with the advertising department, advertising uh, work, I knew that a viewer's attention focused and that is what I used in this particular in getting my uh, work accepted that I said that the signal is most seen when there is nothing around it distracted your attention and this was established subsequently and the government allowed me to go ahead subsequently when I went to Australia when I went to Europe etc I kept watching and everywhere everywhere the signal posts are dark green or dark blue or in black some places it is black so I'm saying why we need to have free thinking? I mean, it's your choice. But then, if you are free, have, if you exercise free thinking, then you are able to find newer meanings in what is put before you. You are able to create out of nothing. You are able to change perceptions uh, after convincing the people that that's the right. What do I do? Suppose I want to change the free thinking. What do I do? Unlearning is very essential. Unlearning is very essential. 
you have learned if you are 30 all these 30 years you have certain concepts uh, understanding you have to be completely uh, willing to say sir look i'm sorry this is what i thought but i'm willing to change unlearning requires you to be unbiased uh, one small example i can give you in a, in a group a few days back a highly biased person uh, of course uh, it has nothing to do communally but otherwise politically biased person. we were talking about the attack in Kashmir which killed the fire for uh, devil's personality and uh, there was no mention of uh, you know no mention of uh, sorrow anything but we were worried about we were expressing sorrow about uh, actors death now to become a viral discussion also so in the group my friends uh, you know were non repetitive they said why are we sending our people to Kashmir to die why can't we stop it why can't we stop it now if we are to think Freely, then this kind of approach must be stopped. Our responsibility should not be dictated by our biases. So we have to be unlearning, means we should now completely decide to uh, be unbiased and then take a pragmatic view of things that are happening, free from ideology. At least in situations where one is supposed to impact society or family in, this, in some way. Uh, as a thought, speech, or action should not be influenced by ideology without any preconceived notions. Go through your perceptions, judgments, likes, and dislikes, and decide to keep it away in important areas where you need to uh, have some kind of involvement in something. You must keep your perceptions, judgments, likes, and dislikes, and decide to keep it away. And you must learn to experience every every moment. Now, experiencing every moment is wonderful if you know how to do it some of these uh, you know uh, i would say godmen but people like sri uh, sri uh, ravi shankar uh, sadguru these are people whom i know but um, i'm sure there may be many many more people from other religions also nothing to do with uh, the Hindu religion as such there are so a lot of uh, people guiding you in experiencing every moment Experiencing every moment uh, gives you a lot of joy because you end up remembering every moment of your life. When you experience every moment, it never goes away from your mind. It never goes away from your memory. That's the best way to remember things. And I can also tell you that as a student, I was not a good student. But in the last year, one thing which changed me was my friend, we had a combined study and my friend telling me, Look, boss, you, you are a very good, you are a good student in the class, your class participation is excellent, but when you write examination, you fail miserably. Of course, I have not failed, but I don't come up to expectations at all. So what he said is, you are, you are doing a mistake, do not by heart formulae. You derive the formulae, and you derive the formulae as if you are discovering the formulae, you are inventing the formulae. And once you do that, you know the subject completely. This is something which changed my final examination. It gave me a first class where I was having third class all along to aggregate and all. I must have passed the district. I was I had actually passed this. So experiencing every moment is very important, not only in your uh, life uh, but also in your work life. And listening is very important. This is something which I found out uh, in the course of my life so far. Listening is a very important uh, uh, faculty that you should develop. It's an art of understanding what exactly the other person says, not what you thought the other person says. Most often, when the other person starts talking, you have decided what he's going to tell you. But verbatim, you start understanding the words that he's, put, he's putting to you, then you will understand a lot of communication problems are solved, a lot of conflicts are resolved. And this, when this is resolved, then you are free to create. Realize that every difficulty or obstruction in your work is an opportunity. Now, with all the six points mentioned above, and then you come across a difficulty, then that you should realize that having resolved the first six uh, points which is mentioned above, now whatever obstruction in front of you is an, is an opportunity. 
every obstruction is an opportunity. This can be another discussion. I don't want to spend time on it. Probably I can answer a specific question on this later on during chat. Last but not least important is when you generally analysis especially we follow three major rules generally Indians and Malayalis especially when in Rome do as the Romans do but this is something which I don't see in foreigners they're not they may come here they may wear dhoti etc but that is not when in Rome do as the Romans do, that they're doing so that they identify with them. if you keep doing the doing like the Romans then you never innovate you have to change. You have to be ready to swim against the current. Then only you innovate. The only thing which the Chinese are above Indians is the fact that they innovate on each and everything. Indians are never interested in innovation. What you have today, you decide that you will give something better tomorrow. And that must start from a free thinking process. Which, are not, which is not influenced by any biases or any other consideration. And one of the considerations is when in Rome do as the Romans do. No. No. The emperor's new clothes. You find that every day, this is something which Malayalis especially uh, you know, practice. The paradigm that most often curtails free thinking and dulls the edge of creativity is emperor's new clothes. It's easy to you know, sing the chorus. But it's very difficult to say this is not correct. One finds it easier and nice to repeat what other people say. You go by mass opinion. Mass opinion generally need not be correct. If you really look at it closely, that's why I gave the uh, examples initially about uh, drinking uh, 8 liters of water, about Kochi and uh, Trivandrum, about uh, environment. Five men and the elephant syndrome. This is something which is very easy for people who are not knowledgeable. Each person, everybody in Kerala is an expert that all of us know. And this five men and the elephant syndrome is something which kills Marayalis especially. Sorry. So that's about it, uh, uh, folks. Uh, I think I have completed my session. Have we, have we run out of time or? Are we still having time for discussion? Uh, sir, we'll take a few questions and uh, then wind up. Uh, so the first question from uh, Deepak Madhilagatta. Can you please share your view on the re relevance of think free, break free in this present COVID crisis when people are losing their jobs? We do expect some innovations to come out from the lessons learned during this period, but how freely they can think as they are influenced by a lot of factors which is not under their control? See, there is a, uh, there is a uh, terminology uh, in, in marketing called Street Fighter. You know, we have looked at COVID from various angles. There are very various conflicting information on uh, COVID. So you really cannot sit judgment on this particular question or give a clear answer to this question. But uh, at this time, what we need to know is that it is just another two things emerge out of this. One is that we should know that it is just another influencer like a disease, uh, which if you are capable of, uh, you know, uh, going through it, you can go through it. Second is that it's your, your immunity is in question. So I would find, I would say that the second point is the most important point. Immunity is in question. And when you talk about immunity, uh, we must go back to a lot of our old habits. For example, I spoke to you about the sunburn and the uh, sunburn. How many of you spend time outside in the sun? I do uh, spend a lot of time in the sun, uh, especially in my TRDCL days uh, from 9 to uh, 3, I used to be quite uh, outside in the sun. Sun improves your immunity quite a bit. We have found, you know, the, uh, the colonial uh, in, in, incursion into our land has affected us in a, in a very bad way. They came and told us that whatever we used to 
practice, whatever we had learned, whatever was our culture, were all old fashioned and uh, you know, improper. They told us that Ayurveda is, uh, uh, I can't use the word openly, but it's useless. But we should go back to Ayurveda for improving our immunity. We should go back to vegetarianism. I'm not saying you should throw away non veg dish, but certainly safer is vegetarianism. It improves your immunity. There are hundreds of articles uh, available in the net today. Is that you know your supplement with a vitamin supplement? I can, in fact, go on talking to you on this quite a long time. The supplements that you take, supplements actually, is, there was an article on this, and there are many articles which say that one uh, 30, 30 days you take a morning supplement that will equal only one breakfast that you take, uh, uh, is the supplement that you get in the body in one breakfast. So, that kind of uh, situation, we should get out of our home. To, you know, start getting mixed, you know, mingled with the environment, mingled with the nature more. That is one thing. Water is another thing. I had shown about 8 liters of water. I didn't want to talk more on that. But since you asked this question, I'll tell you. Now, there's a, this uh, drinking 8 liters of water, that rule, in fact, that was popularized during a time when uh, bottled water came into the market. Could be a coincidence, but I view it as a marketing strategy. I am a person who have been drinking tap water all along, intravenous, and there is nothing, no problem. My immunity, I am sure, is much better than other people. My family drinks tap water. Only thing is that we use a candle filter, you know, that uh, uh, calcium filter. That's all we use so that the dirt is filtered off. But otherwise, we are perfectly okay with that. For the last 30 years, we have been drinking. Uh, tap water. So this way, we need to improve our immunity. That's what I have to say. And uh, COVID, to fight COVID, probably that is the thinking, the, the change in thinking that we should start adopting is that fundamental issues we should tackle. The rest will, you know, solve by itself. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question from Lijo Joseph. What in your experience would be the top three factors that a project manager should pursue or persist to influence change in perception? Uh, change in perception as far as the project is concerned. You know, the work culture is very important. The second is that uh, second, yeah, very important uh, aspect of uh, you know uh, when you're talking about uh, project participants is that uh, you must analyze the project completely before you start uh, you know executing the project. Analysis and planning is very important. So what happens is when you get a project, you are probably for your your basic. Uh, attention goes to the completion dates, your targets. It's very, very important. I'm not saying it's not important, but uh, the target date should take a second position. The most important position should be you know, a, a complete knowledge about the product. Complete knowledge and not about what you're going to do in the project, what the project demands. In fact, there is a very famous uh, uh, you know, uh, cartoon by IBM which says this is how the uh, analyst uh, understood it, this is how the customer explained it, and this is how this happened, designed it, and this is how ultimately a swing is uh, installed in such a way that neither it swings nor anybody can sit on it. So same way, the project, when you, when, when you are in a project, the free thinking should happen when you are analyzing the requirements of the project and what you are capable of delivering. There is any disconnect in that. First, you need to solve that and then only start looking at the completion dates and how you are going to complete it. Sure, sir. Yeah. One question from Adar Chandran. Is creativity, free thinking, lateral th thinking, etc. be learned? See, for some people, like management, Management, you know, uh, nobody taught management to Marwadis and Gujaratis. Nobody 
be taught management. Like management, it can be learned. And creativity can be learned. That's what people do in National Institute of Design when it, you know, talk about products, etc. That's what they do in uh, architectural colleges. That's what we do in engineering colleges. That's what we do all along. But uh, some people we see that they are born. You know, let's take the case of uh, sports, you know, football and uh, tennis, etc. There are people who come up by coaching, etc. But there are people who are born with a talent. So I uh, cannot say it cannot be learned, but certainly people born with a talent, then for the job, uh, becomes, uh, you know, they excel. Similarly, creativity uh, can be learned, but then, you know, 60-70% of the job is done when you are able to put aside all your preconceived notions, biases, etc. and look at something like you, like the child looks at you, that kind that I, those eyes you saw, when the child looks at you, the same passion, completely drinking what you get in front of you. When you are able to do that, creativity will come to you, much of the job is done. You will start finding the difference. Answer the question? Yes, sir. Uh, so we'll take uh, one last question uh, from Nisha. Is there any specific culture that promotes free thinking? No, no, absolutely no. I mean, uh, if you really look at me, you know, I mean, look at it that way. Uh, from my experience, uh, uh, from my travel, whatever little travel I have done. I think China uh, certainly is allowed to think freely. That's why they innovate so much. Everything they innovate. That is where they uh, differ from Indians. Uh, from. Every every single thing uh, what is developed uh, across the world, they bring it home and then they improve on it. So that can happen only when there are you know two three things. One is your commitment to the country, your commitment to your society. Your commitment to excel, all these are there, you know, commitment to excel is there in Malayalis. Uh, certainly is there. But commitment to your country, commitment to excel, uh, sorry, commitment to your society, I think we are lacking a little bit. If we improve on that, I think we will be, uh, on these three grounds, if we improve, we will be on par with them. So that's it. Uh, any more questions on that? Uh, yeah, it's, it's sir. Uh, KK, over to you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, hi, all. Uh, what a wonderful session it was, sir. Uh, think free, break free. Anil Kumar Pandala delivered many sessions to PMI. We have been associating with uh, Anil Kumar Pandala, sir, for, from 2015 when he attended, he delivered a session on uh, Waves 2015. That was the first time we associated. Then he became one of our close associate and uh, um, every session was very new and uh, it is really thought provoking like free thinking creating something from nothing breaking conventions like cl mahatma gandhi will gates uh, trdcl you get uh, selected into the united nations development goals broke some of the the common myths which are prevailed like sunburns sits public versus private understanding the real truth we need to make sure that we understand the real truth behind it and a lot of interesting observations and uh, free of pre pretensions uh, and uh, the most important thing which i carry today is that uh, our picture postcards in your life that make your character that is a very bold state which i will carry today from this session and uh, i would like to place on record our sincere thanks from PHI, Kerala and all the chapters which have associated with us uh, in uh, this for giving us a very wonderful session. Thank you, sir, for making it happen. Thank you, KK, and thank to you, PMI Kerala. Thank you, PMI Trivandrum, for the opportunity given to me. I'm sure that uh, I hope that I could do justice, at least some justice to what was expected of me. And uh, please uh, feel free to give your comments to PMI. Uh, all the members so that you know in future i can improve wherever it's required thank you sure sir yes i would like to place the gratitude 
to Jay Kishore and uh, Sindhya for coordinating this session wonderfully well. And uh, finally, to all of you who have joined from different parts of the world for this great knowledge. Thank you once again. Before closing, I'll be sharing the, the PDU details to you. So I uh, hope you can see the PDU claim code, which is there. So, so you can um, claim your PDU. And the next section uh, will be from Rajat Karnagaran Nair, and he is the CEO of Robits. Uh, he is, again, not new to PMI Kerala, and he is doing uh, wonderful sessions previously as well. So his session will be of Life is Beautiful, and believe it or not. It's on 10th of May 2020 from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's on Sunday. So we will be getting the email soon. And stay tuned, we will be getting the emails and I will be taking it forward from there. Thank you all once again, and thank you, sir, for making this wonderful session.